Every one of God's children need to be involved. It's not a job for a few of us. It's a job for all of us. It's not a job for a few of us to give a few tithes and a few offerings and support missionaries. It's a job for all of us. open your Bible, please, to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 6. You're going to need your Bible. We're going to be looking at a few of these verses. And I think it was, if you're using the church Bible, I think it was page 689 uh, in, your, uh, in your Bible there. Well, ants love to eat birthday cake. All you have to do is put a birthday cake out on a picnic table and stand back and watch what happens. Uh, they'll find it. I, I'm not sure how, but they, uh, they'll find it. They love it. Speaking of ants, um, every year our church has a church picnic. And a number of years ago, we went down to White Rock for our church picnic. And we had a great time. We always have a wonderful time at the church picnic. But we got all set up and within an hour we started noticing all these red ants crawling over our shoes and on our lawn chairs. And I thought, oh, this isn't good. And so I asked one of the men of the church, uh, can you please find where these ants are coming from? What's happening? So he came back in a little while and said, Pastor, we have set up right over top of the pathway that the ants use to go through the grass. Well, I can tell you it did not take us long to move to another place. We got out of their way. Ants are really, truly amazing creatures, as I'm sure you know. And we can learn a few good lessons from our little ant friends. Now, one of these lessons is about working together in harmony for a good cause. Next Sunday is our 25th church birthday. And we'll have lots of food and lots of gifts Lots of fun, and we'll have lots of birthday cake because ants love birthday cake. Ants are really good workers, and birthday cake is like a reward for all that will work and serve the Lord. Many of you here today have been with us for many years. We, we go back a long way, and um, many of you have been here for more than a year. Many for many months, and some even relatively new. But we thank God for each and every one of you because you have helped to make Grace Baptist Church what it is today. It's because of you. So if there's one lesson to be learned from our tiny little ant friends, it's that every one of us need to be involved in serving the Lord for his honor, for his glory, working together in unity and harmony. And so today I would like to speak with you on the subject, ants love birthday cake. And so let's have a word of prayer before we go any further. Again, our Heavenly Father, we love and thank you so very much for all of your goodness, the rewards you give us, the blessings that you uh, uh, grant, and, and the de daily benefits that you heap upon us. It's really incredible as we sit back, take stock, we count our many blessings. It surprises us all what you've done. And sometimes we lose sight of that. We get focused on maybe the end of our nose, and we forget about all of the great things that you've done for us and through us. And we want to give you praise and glory today. Please help us to, to have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that will take it all in. Father, teach us your lesson about the humble ant. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, an ant, A-N-T, not A-U-N-T. That's a different kind of ant. A-N-T. We all know what they are. But um, what does the name mean And when we say an ant? There goes an ant. Oh, I got an ant on my sleeve. What is an ant? The word ant comes from a word that means to bite. So now you know. The word ant means to bite. 
Ants have been called one of the most successful organisms on the planet. According to wikihow.com, ants outnumber people. For every one person, there are 140,000 ants. And so, if you multiply 140,000 times 8 billion people in the world, you come up with a number like 1 trillion, 120 billion. Whoa, that's a lot of ants. However, another website estimates that there are more than a quadrillion ants in the world. Well, how much is a quadrillion? Well, we know what a million is. A thousand millions make up a trillion. Uh, no, a billion. That's it. A million, a billion. That's a thousand millions is a billion. And then a thousand billions is a trillion. But a thousand trillions is a quadrillion. We're talking a lot of ants. I read where uh, sci some scientists estimate that all of the ants put together make up 15 to 25 percent of all animal body weight in the world. That's quite something. So no one knows how many ants there are. Only God knows how many ants there are. But what we do, do know is that there's a lot of ants all over the world. Now, although ants are found worldwide, I have read that there are no ants in Iceland or Greenland, which really isn't all that green, you know, or Antarctica. Possibly a few remote islands in the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, possibly, but otherwise ants are everywhere and they show up at picnics too. Don't we know that? Well, let's take a look at your average uh, ant. Would you put that picture up for us, please? Here we have a picture of an average ant. They have six legs, count them, six legs. At the end of each, there's a little hook that enables the ant to help hold on to things. And boy, can they run. They run fast. If you were to make a comparison between how fast an ant can run and how fast uh, a human can run, um, the human would have to run at 70 kilometers an hour, that's like 40 miles an hour, in order to equal the ant. A horse only runs, is it 20, 25 miles an hour, something like that. You'd pass every horse, I mean, man, go down to the Kentucky Derby, you'd win every time. Ants are fast, and they are strong. You see, they got these two big uh, mandible things, these big uh, pinchers, on the front of their face there. And they use that to carry things. And they use that to bite. And that's where they get their name from. If they didn't bite, I guess they'd be called uncles, I suppose. I don't know about that. <laughs> don't quote me on that. Okay? Now, they also have these two big antenna on top of their head. And they use those things to detect chemicals. They detect air currents. They detect vibrations. And they also use these things to communicate. You know, they touch each other's uh, antenna. And I thought that was a little funny. I can imagine two ants getting together, you know. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> but that's sort of what they do. Uh, now, are they strong? Boy, are they strong. Ants can lift 20 times their body weight. How much can you lift? They can lift 20 times their body weight. That would be like a 200-pound man lifting a 4,000-pound pickup truck. One of those. An ant is that strong. And can they build massive colonies, too? Wow. They call them nests, but uh, boy, they underground, they build these complex underground networks with tunnels and rooms, and some of these join together. The nests join together and they're called super colonies. Super colonies. Now, up until the year 2000, that's 24 years ago, the largest known ant super colony was found in Japan. And the colony was estimated to contain 306 million ant workers and 1 million queen ants. And they were living in 45,000 
6,000 nests interconnected by underground tunnels over an area of 670 acres. And then in the year 2000, they discovered an enormous super colony of Argentine ants. Those are just little guys. And they're found in southern Europe. It contained 33 huge ant colonies along a 6,000 kilometer stretch of coastland in southern Europe. And they all belong to this one big super colony estimated with millions of nests and billions of workers interspersed all with three populations of another super colony. We got a picture. We got to show you this. Look at that. The dots show you where the, uh, the colony, they found the colony. And so over here, you know, I guess in Spain, oh, down through Portugal and, you know, under Spain, up into France and over here into Italy, that's one big super colony of ants. Isn't that amazing? I never knew half this stuff until I started researching it. The Ohio State University estimates that there are 22,000 different species of ants. 22,000. Now that, I'll give you a couple of them. There's the bullet ant. Put that picture up. There's the bullet ant. How would you like a backyard full of those? The bullet ant is the largest ant. It's about an inch long. And it has the most painful bite. <laughs> the bullet ant. And uh, there's a, then the tiniest of ants is called the pharaoh ant. Just like pharaoh in Egypt, the pharaoh ant, it's the smallest. It's just tiny little two millimeter long. It's about like one sixteenth of an inch long. They're tiny little ants. And some people think they, have been, they were involved with the ten plagues of Egypt. I'm not sure. But then we have the army ants. You're going to love these. The army ants. How would you like to wake up staring down one of those? Now, they're called army ants because apparently they're always on the move. Then there's carpenter ants. Carpenter ants, we don't have a picture of them. You don't want to see them. But they prefer dead, damp wood to build their nests in. And then we have the red ant. The red ant. Ooh, there they are. They're pretty common around here. They're pretty common at our picnic in White Rock. Yeah, that's a real footful of them, isn't it? Kind of gives me the willies to look at that. Let's get rid of that picture, shall we? <laughs> and then there are termites. Uh, termites really, they say, are apparently not ants at all. They're more closely related to cockroaches. However, I guess for general terms, they're referred to as an ant. You know, they got six legs and that stuff. Termites. Well, there you have uh, six of the uh, 22,000 different species. But one thing that all 22,000 have in common is that they all work together to get the job done. That's what the ants have in common. Now, the context of Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 to 11, Howard, Brother Howard did a wonderful job in leading us in reading those scriptures today. But the context starts in verse 1. I want you to see it. It says, My son, in fact, read it out loud with me, please. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend, Go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. You say, what does that mean? Well, it means that Solomon was telling his son, if you have a buddy that comes to you and wants you to co-sign a loan for him, you're snared. You are in a snare. This is just what the Bible teaches us. And many people have fallen financially because when they've co-signed for the loan, the person defaults on the loan. Now they get sucked into it and they get pulled down. Now they owe a whole bunch of money they weren't planning on. And their friend 
And it could have even been a relative says, oh, uh, trust me, this is a good business venture or I I really need your help. They come, they ask you to co-sign. So you do because they're a friend. That seems to be why Solomon's son would have done it. Oh, he's a friend. But Solomon comes and says, son, watch out about this. Don't don't fall into this. So you see in verse 6, that's why it says, go to the ant thou sluggard. The friend of Solomon's son apparently didn't want to work hard and raise the money he needed to raise for his business venture. He wanted to maybe get rich quick. So he goes to Solomon's son and says, hey friend, you know, co-sign this here for me and we'll get rich together and you'll do it because you're a buddy. And he doesn't want to put in the, the years of hard work in order to raise the capital necessary to do this business venture. And so... Solomon addresses him in verse 6 and says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. What is a sluggard? A sluggard is a person of little motion. A person who is idle and lazy. A person with no accomplishments. This is a sluggard. But look at our little ant friend in verse 7. Now it says, which the ant, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. You see, the ant is missing these things. We need these things. The ant doesn't have them. Say, what is a guide? A guide is someone that will show you the proper way. If you were crazy enough to climb up Mount Everest, you would need a guide to show you the way through all of the rocks and and the passages and so on. If you went out there by yourself without a guide, chances are you're not coming back. (laughs) You know, even with a guide, you might not come back. So uh, think that one through, eh? You mountain climbers. But a guide is someone who shows you the proper way. An overseer is someone who watches over you mainly for your safety. That's an overseer. And a ruler is an ultimate authority. Now some of you will be thinking a ruler, well, wait a minute. The ants, they have the queen. She's the ruler, isn't she? No. In truth, all that the queen is, is just another ant. That's all the queen is. Her whole job in life is just to make babies. That She does her job. They call her the queen, but she doesn't rule. And if you look at verse 9, we're told here in verse 9, 10, 11, that poverty will find the sluggard. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth. That means he's on his way. I can almost hear his footsteps. He's coming my way. And thy want, that means to be in want, in need, poverty. Thy want as an armed man. So the guy traveling must be an army. An army guy coming your way. Ooh, that doesn't sound good, but that is exactly what will happen. Poverty will find the sluggard, not just financial poverty. Financial poverty is bad enough, but in my humble opinion, spiritual poverty is even worse. That means when we're too lazy to read the Bible every day and get on our knees and pray, we're being spiritual sluggards, and spiritual poverty is going to find us. Our souls are going to be empty. Times of trouble will hit us. We won't know what to do. We'll run to our spiritual cupboards, but they're bare. No, no. What we need to do is we need to be busy like the ants. Every day, the ants are busy. We need to be spiritual ants. And we need to be going to visit the Lord Jesus and read the Word of God and pray and come and attend the church services. You see, it's more than just a, a, well, it's not a social club. It's a family. And in the family, you'll feel the presence of Jesus in his family. He is the head, we're the body. You'll feel his presence here. The the singing, the fellowship will encourage you. The preaching will help nourish you and build you up. Here at Grace Baptist Church, we have tried to learn a lesson from the ant. And we've tried to be very busy serving and working for our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been teaching and preaching the word of God which is the food for our souls. And we've been busy with our Heavenly Father's business, which is to reach the world with the gospel. 
That's why the church is in business. Here in Surrey, we have a map over here, and in Surrey, we're trying to reach our little corner of the world through soul winning. And the rest of the world, we depend upon missionaries to help us to reach to the uh, furthest ends of the world. Now, we've been at it 25 years. What's been the result of all this? Well, the result of all this has been a solid, growing church of good Christian people who are living godly lives and are happy in the Lord. I also believe we have strong families with clean, well-behaved, happy young people. I know there's always an exception to every, you know, I know that, but as a general rule, that's what I believe. I try and keep my ear to the track as much as I can to know, you know, where people are at. And that's my assessment. Now, folks, you need to bear with me because what I'm about to do is a little bit of sanctified boasting. I didn't want to do this, and I had an argument with myself, but I lost the argument. And I'm about to do a little sanctified boasting, and I need you to bear with me because what I want is for you to see the results of our labors for the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like the ants produce results, they produce fruit, so to speak. So likewise, our labors over 25 years have produced fruit. Now, the Apostle Paul did a little bit of sanctified boasting himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. You'll find it. And he wrote to the Christians at the church of Corinth, and he needed them to understand something important. And so Paul wrote in verse 23, and he made reference to other apostles. Here's what he said. Are they ministers of Christ? And then he said, I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. And what Paul was doing was he was comparing himself as an apostle with the other apostles. And he was just pointing out a fact. That none of the others had suffered as much as he had. None of them had had more abundant labors than him. None of them had been beaten with stripes above measure more than he had. I mean really. Goodness. He was quite a man. But he said, I speak as a fool. And really only a fool would speak like that. But he spoke like that so that they could understand what he was trying to say. So he went out on a limb and he did a little bit of sanctified boasting. And I call it sanctified boasting because I, I believe it's not good. It is really not good to look too much at your own accomplishments. I don't think that's healthy. It can, it can lead to pride It can lead to boasting. It can lead to selfishness. It will lead to a downfall. Old King Nebuchadnezzar had that happen to him. He stood and looked all over Babylon and he said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? And he started boasting how wonderful he was. And then the judgment of God hit him. So you see, it's a mistake to look too much at your accomplishments. But I'm going to go out on a limb here just like the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to, for a moment, speak as a fool in order to help us all to see what we've been able to accomplish by the grace of God and for His glory. And so, after 25 years of serving the Lord, what have we got to show for it? What has happened? Well, number one, we've grown. We started with six people In the living room of my home, my pulpit was a cardboard box. Five of those people were my wife and I and our three children. And we had one senior lady. That's how we began. And since then, we have outgrown every building we've been in. And we are reaching the limits of this building. Our Sunday morning attendance is usually now in excess of 200 people plus our online audience. Our online audience on Sunday morning is about 50 people. Something else is that we've seen more people these days put their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior 
than ever before in our history. Something else is that we are helping to support now 122 gospel preaching missionaries, which is more missionaries than many other churches much, much larger than we are. You see, I speak as a fool here. Over the past 25 years, our church has given over one and a half million dollars to support missions around the world. Isn't that amazing? Who would have thought? We get reports back from our missionaries all the time. And in a year's time, we're finding that they're leading, on average, a thousand souls to Christ. 122 missionaries are leading a thousand souls to Christ worldwide. And we get these reports back. And so we don't have a, an actual final figure, a number. But we estimate 10,000 people have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior worldwide. This is above and beyond the souls we've seen led to Christ right here in Surrey, right in our own church. But approximately 10,000 people have been saved as a result of our missionaries. Now, here's something interesting. If you take the one and a half million dollars that we've raised, and you take the 10,000 souls that have been saved, and you put them together, you'll find that every soul got saved for $150. <laughs> That's just the math. Now, don't carry that to the bank, okay? It doesn't mean that if you say, well, I'll give $150 and... Someone will be saved. It doesn't work that way. But it does work. We support gospel preaching missionaries. They lead souls to Christ. They write letters and send back here and tell us about it. And we share it with you. And we all rejoice together. You see, some sow the seed. Some water the seed. And some harvest the plants. And then the next day, the person who was sowing the seed is now watering the seed. And the person who was harvesting the plants is now putting, you know, sowing the seed. You see, the thing moves around. Everyone gets a chance to sow seed. Everyone gets a chance to, to water. Everyone gets a chance to harvest. It's just exciting work to be in. Wow. I can hardly wait till we get to heaven. We're going to meet 10,000 people who got saved because of this missionary that we support and that missionary we support and this missionary over here that we support. You get the idea? That's pretty exciting stuff. And all of heaven rejoices when just one gets saved. Well, we've got somewhere around 10,000. This year, we hope and expect to take on the support of a few more missionaries to help reach the world. Now, not only this, my boasting isn't done yet, but we've also been able to make purchases. The chairs you're sitting in cost us $24,000. We were able to raise that money and buy those chairs cash, no debt. The hymn books that you held in your hand and were singing the great hymns of the faith, cost $5,000. We are able to raise that money and pay it cash. We don't owe a penny. Much of the flooring in our building is new. It cost us $15,000. We were able to raise that money and pay cash. We don't owe a cent on it. This piano over here, brand new piano, it cost us $30,000, or was it $35,000? Yeah, I forget. We raised the money, we bought it cash. We don't owe a penny on it. The air conditioning cost us $16,000. We raised it all cash. These are blessings from God. There's no other way to explain what we've been able to do, except God be with us. 
I mean, if we were some kind of business or, I don't know, a, a shyster or something, we might be able to, you know, fleece and whatever. But folks, we, we're just common people. We're like ants. There's no super duper ants amongst us. We're all common. And that's the way it's supposed to be. In the ant colony, in the family of God, God has all these children. He doesn't have superman and superwoman. He's, he's got kids. Mm, that's us. And sometimes we're not always the best kids. We should be. We're not always on our best behavior. And sometimes we probably let, let them down. We let our heavenly father down. And we, maybe we make him cry. I don't know. But uh, we are what we are. We're just normal folks. But look what God has done through us. And I'm saying this for his honor and for his glory. On top of all this, we've been able to give thousands and thousands of dollars to help feed hungry people and support weak people and help missionaries to put up buildings. Now remember, I'm boasting like a fool here, but it's the only way to show you that by grace and blessing of Almighty God, in proportion to the work we have done, do we enjoy the blessings. It's all for God's glory and honor. And next week is the birthday cake. Ants love birthday cake. I think that the birthday cake is like the blessings that God gives to his busy ants. Why is it that our church and that our people have enjoyed so many blessings? The answer is because we've been busy serving our Lord Jesus Christ. The message today is unmistakable. Get busy serving the Lord and he will bless you and exalt you like he's done for our church. Now, I think we can all agree it's very easy to be lazy. Some of us have a little experience in that department. It's harder to work. But I can tell you the truth. God blesses good old-fashioned hard work. Now, Something else I want you to see here. The ants, they're, they're forever at, at it. And they're working in harmony and unity, but they're missing a few things. Take a look, please, again at verse 7. Look what they don't have. The ants, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler. Now, the ants don't have a guide, someone to show them the way. But... Us, we have at least three guides. We have the Bible, which is one of our best guides. It's the instruction book. Someone has said B-I-B-L-E stands for basic instruction before leaving earth. It's the cookbook, the instruction manual of life. God's given it to us. And that's why we need to be reading it every day. One of these days, you're going to get to heaven, you're going to meet Haggai, the prophet, and his first question is going to be, Have, did you read my book? And you're going to say, i sorry, I have to go. Nah, you want to read it here on earth. Don't make up excuses in heaven. I'm just a little tongue in cheek there, but you know what I mean. Read God's word. Read God's word. And when you finish, read God's word and read God's word. Let that book get into you. Let it become part of your DNA. We have the Bible. That is a guide. But also we have the Holy Spirit. When you trusted Jesus as your Savior, Jesus came into your heart, but guess what? The Holy Spirit came in as well. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, it says that if you do not have the Holy Spirit, you are none of His. It means you're not even saved. The presence of the Holy Spirit gives you great assurance. Because some of us say, well, am I really saved? I mean, I prayed. I thought I was sincere, but ah, I just committed a sin. I just had a bad thought. Uh, things aren't going so well for me. You know, I'm feeling uh, funny in my heart here. Am I really saved or not? And that's where the Holy Spirit can give you great assurance, especially when you read his word. He'll assure you. He'll comfort you. He is our guide. So you have at least three guides, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, but you also have the experience, the counsel, the prayers, and the love of other godly Christians. 
men and women who know the Lord, who can help guide you through certain decisions in life, help comfort you when you need it. And so the ants, they don't have any of this, but we have it. Secondly, the ants have no overseer. The overseer is someone who can watch over them for their safety. But folks, we have overseers in our lives. Number one is God put parents in our lives. Parents are overseers. You say, well, my parents were pretty lousy. You're here. Huh? You made it. They must not have been that bad. Oh, I'm sure there's some bad parents. I'm sure. And if we wanted to, you know, really get worldly, you know, if we really wanted to sicken God, we could, we could talk about how lousy our parents were. That doesn't honor God at all. We're told to honor our parents. Even if you finally figured out your parents weren't perfect, you finally, the light bulb went on. Oh, my parents aren't perfect. Well, you finally figured it out. And neither will you be. And by the way, neither were Adam and Eve. Right? Even Noah went out and got drunk. Find me a perfect parent, would you? Actually, I don't think I want to meet them. I would feel so ashamed of myself. <laughs> I'm not a perfect parent. That's why I don't have perfect kids. I never had perfect parents. And their problem was that they didn't have perfect parents either. But God gave you parents to help, us, to help you in life, to, to oversee you, to make sure you're fed and clothed. And they would, you know, help you get off the street at night and that sort of thing. Make sure you're educated. When you had a toothache, they'd take you to the doctor, the dentist there. A bellyache, they'd take you to the emergency, leave you there. <laughs> you see, you had overseers, your parents. Also, your boss at work, even though you may not like him or her, there's an overseer for you. And you see, oh, my boss at work, oh, pff. in fact, my whole work I work for, pff. yeah, well, how about your paycheck? Well, yeah, that's not all that great. Well, how about you have no paycheck? Which would you rather? A paycheck or no paycheck? Well, at least you have a paycheck. No, maybe your boss isn't perfect, your work isn't perfect, but, but please don't dishonor God who gave you the job, who opened the door. You begged him, Lord, I need work. He gave you work. Now, how, you know, six months later, now, ugh. You know, this is the job God gave you, right? You've got overseers at church too. It's called your pastor. Not a perfect pastor. Boy, oh boy, if you, th listen to this. If you think that I'm a lousy pastor, you ought to hear me play the violin. You don't know what pain is until you've heard me play the violin. God loves us more than the ants that crawl around in the super colonies. He's given us a guide, three of them. He's given us overseers. And also, the ants have no ruler. Oh, the queen, she's just a baby machine. But we have a ruler who never makes mistakes. When our ruler makes rules, we know they're good rules. He's a ruler. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the true one. He is the just one. And he cares for each and every one of us. It's not like we're a number or some kind of sea of faces. He doesn't even have a number for us. It's not like that at all. He loves us intimately. And therefore learn a lesson from the ant. Work like the ant does and God will reward you too. Let me ask you this. Are you a son or a daughter? And are you being the best son or the best daughter you can be? Are you? Are you a husband or a wife? Are you being the very best husband or the very best wife you can be? Are you a student? Are you being the best student you can be? Are you an employee? Are you being the best employee you can be? Are you an employer? 
Are you being the best employer you can be? Are you a church member? Are you being the best church member you can be? You see where we're going with this? In Galatians chapter 6 verse 7, it tells us, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God wants us to reap a good harvest. God wants to reward his children. The heavenly father delights in giving birthday cakes to working ants. Because ants love birthday cake. And God knows it. Well, pastor, is it too late? I hear what you're saying. I haven't been around here for years working hard like some of the others have. Is it too late for me? Is it too late for this little ant to become a busy ant and live my life for Jesus? And the answer is no, it's not too late. There's still time. You see, in Matthew chapter 20, our Lord Jesus gave a very interesting story of a wealthy man who went out to hire people to work for him. And he said these words, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, which by the way was a man's wage, a working wage, was a penny a day back 2,000 years ago. So if you're making at least a penny a day, you're doing pretty good. That's just my commentary. And he went out about the third hour, and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, there's only one hour left then in the workday, the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. The first meaning, the direct meaning of that is a salvation message. But the secondary application is also very legitimate. You see, if you don't work and serve the Lord, there's no reward. You won't get the birthday cake that God can give. But if you'll get busy and serve the Lord, he won't forget you. Yes, there's still time to get active and busy in the service of our Lord Jesus. Now I'm about to tell you a little story and we're done. Some of you have heard this story before, but I really like this story. So, you know, it's my sermon, so I'm going to get to tell the story. (laughs) There was uh, many years ago, a pastor who was really tired and he was worn down to a frazzle working in the ministry. That can do it to a guy. And he figured, I got to get along with God and recharge my batteries. I got to just kind of get my spirits up. And so he rented a log cabin in the wilderness. He drove out there and parked his car. He had his duffel bag of a few clothes and his shaving stuff and his Bible. He went in, sat down, made himself a cup of coffee there in the kitchen. And as he was in the kitchen, he noticed something on the side of the kitchen counter. There there were these ants and they were trying to pull a dead cockroach up the side of the, the counter. And he, he watched that and the ants got up so far and couldn't seem to, and then bah, down they went, hit the ground. And the pastor thought, oh, I guess that's it for you. No, the ants all got busy again and grabbed you know, a piece of the cockroach. Everyone grabbed a piece and started hauling it up the side of the counter again. They got a little higher this time. And then down they went again. And the pastor was really intrigued by this. And a third time, they got the cockroach up pretty close to the top of the counter. And then they couldn't get it any further. And down they went. And he thought, what is the problem? And so he put on his bifocals, right? Some of you know what those are, right? Bifocals. And he got down and they're crawling it up and he's looking close and he saw the problem. You see, there was about a dozen ants all pulling on this cockroach. Each ant, you know, had a piece of it. But sitting on top of the cockroach, going for a ride and not doing anything, were two or three ants sitting there. And so... He took out his 
his pen, and as they got up to the top, he just gave them a little flip up on top of the counter. And he said, when they got to the top of the counter, those ants had a party with that cockroach. They had their picnic. And it was like birthday cake. And ants love birthday cake. And they had their cockroach dinner there on the top. And the pastor got to thinking, you know, there's a lot of truth to what he just saw. Some of God's ants are going to be working hard. Day in, day out, year in, year out, they're going to be serving the Lord, living for him. And then there's going to be a few ants who go along for the ride. And, you know, God has to sort that out in heaven. But can you imagine if next week we end up in heaven? Have you been helping pull a cockroach? Or have you been going along for the ride? Every one of God's children need to be involved. It's not a job for a few of us. It's a job for all of us. It's not a job for a few of us to give a few tithes and a few offerings and support missionaries. It's a job for all of us. I told you earlier that in 25 years, we've given over one and a half million dollars for missions. It's my opinion only. I mean, I praise God for that. You don't know. I jump out of my skin for that. That is incredible. But I have to stop and think, what if all of us got on board? Maybe we wouldn't have given one and a half. Maybe we would have given two and a half million. Maybe we, we wouldn't be supporting 122 missionaries. Maybe we'd be supporting 222 missionaries. You see what I'm saying? You know, it's one thing to be saved on your way to heaven. It's something else to be serving the Lord as you're on your way to heaven. That's the message today. It's the lesson that we learn from the ants. So I want you to think about this. You need to humble yourself before an almighty, all-wise God. You say, why? It's because just as you and I are so much bigger than a tiny ant, even the bullet ant is, is only an inch long. Look how much bigger you are. One step of your foot and that's the end of the bullet ant. You're so much wiser. You know so much more. You can do so much more than any ant. And just as you're bigger than an ant, God is bigger than you. He knows so much more than you know. He's so much wiser. He's so much stronger. He can open doors you never even thought were there. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ever ask or think. That's the kind of God that loves us. You need to humble yourself before God today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Today is the day. Humble yourself like a humble ant. Make your way to God today in prayer and ask for his mercy and for his grace to help you to work the best you can for his honor, for his glory. You do this and he will bless you for it. Now in a moment I'm going to pray, but before I do, I'm wondering if perhaps someone is here today and they don't know what would happen to them if they died. Death is just kind of a big gaping black hole and what's going to happen to me? Perhaps you're here and you don't know yet. You don't know God on a personal basis. You know about God, but you don't really know him intimately. Well, his name is Jesus. And if you do not have a close fellowship with Jesus, chances are it's because you need salvation. What is salvation? Salvation means to be born again. It means to be saved from your sin. Saved from going to hell. It means to be made part of God's family. You see, you're spiritually born into God's family. 
Say, how can we do it? We do it by faith. Not by baptism. Not by communion. Not by church membership. We do it by faith through prayer. You have to pray. In your heart, you have to cry out to Jesus. You have to confess to him your sinfulness. Because only sinners get saved. Confess your sinfulness. Ask Jesus Christ to wash away your sin and come into your heart and be your savior. If you do that, he will save you. He will come into your heart. Would you close your eyes, please, and bow your heads? Now is the time for us to pray. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word.